Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, How Connected Biological Safety Cabinets Can Support Your Lab, Best Practices Today and Future Trends. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more, visit thermofisher.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education window at the bottom of the screen to obtain your credits. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. David Phillips, NSF accredited BSc field certifier enhanced. David, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks for allowing me to present this uh, examination of connectivity on class two biosafety cabinets. I've been working with biosafety cabinets for over 40 years, first as a, uh, with a, a service company that serviced biosafety cabinets and containment equipment, and then since 2007 with Thermo Fisher Scientific. I like to say there are car people and music people and food people and of course more, but I'm a BSC person. Uh, I find their design, performance, manufacture, use, uh, all the people involved endlessly interesting, and so I find this topic of particular interest as well. Uh, so uh, let's move on and see the next slide. Now, when we when we talk about connectivity, connectivity is generally viewed as an inherently good thing. Uh, occasionally, it bumps up against privacy or security concerns. But overall, we've seen so many benefits in connection uh, with our computers and our thermostats, other intelligent devices, uh, with ourselves through social media, that the benefits are so great, we want to connect everything, including in this case, our scientific laboratories. Uh, next slide. Whether it's mobile phone subscriptions per 100 people, the share of the population using the internet, uh, whether it's in Canada, the US, other countries around the world, uh, there is this constant trend towards uh, connection. This trend is not only quantitative, it's qualitative. Uh, what we communicate is changing as well. When we first, uh, years ago, we were connected if we knew what the status of family births and deaths and just the major life events. Now we want to see photos of what our friends had for dinner, dinner and, uh, and that, that insect they found on their car. Uh, next slide. Uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific is committed to becoming the digital, leading digital science company by 2030. Uh, this slide is a visual illustration of our digital science platform customer value wheel. We see eight technology segments. These eight technology segments support two key areas of focus with our customers, increased productivity in the lab and scientific acceleration, which supports our mission of enabling our customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. Uh, next slide. Now, connecting means different things for different types of laboratory equipment. For connected freezers, it means monitoring the temperature to make sure our samples are preserved. For our connected pipette aids, it means a standard protocol with sample volumes and sizes that is able to be shared through different devices in the laboratory, as well as other locations. Last week, Mike Montanaz and I reached out to Mirko Spies in our R&D center in near Frankfurt, Germany, and we were able to, with use of split screen, we, we captured the functioning of our Instrument Connect application and website with our new connected cabinets. And so as an illustration of connection, let's take a look at that now. Thanks, Mirko, for, for helping me with this demonstration today. I think it'll be really helpful to get a, a sense, a real-time sense of how the interaction between our app and dashboard and the uh, cabinet itself. So let's start off by you uh, turning on the cabinet, if you would, and let me know when you have it turned on. Yes, sir.
Okay, it's running. Okay, so uh, uh, right now, our, our this cabinet, uh, as kind of the thermo scientific design, uh, when the window is closed and the fans are on, the fans are in a reduced flow standby mode. This allows the cabinet to maintain a clean and contained work area. Uh, and and we've seen now on the dashboard that it has picked up that the uh, uh, that the fans are on. They're saying that the fans are in reduced flow. So the next thing we're going to do, uh, uh, Mirko, if you could raise the, the window to operational height. Yes, sir. And uh, let us know when it's there. Now you'll see, you'll typically see a difference between the okay. uh, window is, uh, is open. Great. Uh, so so we see a difference between the app and the dashboard. The app uh, tends to respond uh, a little bit quicker, uh, but the dashboard has more detail. And so um, we've seen. Excuse me. So so we'll see the. Uh, uh, when it when it shows up, we'll see that the window is uh, the window is open. Um, I'm showing. Are, you, are the window right now is in the correct position, Mirko? It's in correct position, and we are waiting uh, for the OK state now. Great. Okay, so uh, the the dashboard is already showing that the window is open. Um, the there's a. There's a typically a delay of a minute or so for the airflow to come up and to full speed and to stabilize. Airflow and when, is ready now. Okay, and then when that happens, you'll see uh, the app will show that the airflow is okay, and then the dashboard will show that the airflow is okay and the window is open. Um, great. So now uh, let's take a look at the dashboard. So uh, let's go to the dashboard. Uh, Mike, if you could change it to that. And in the dashboard, you'll notice uh, it tells you a lot about the cabinet. Uh, it gives you the, the firmware update. Uh, at the last update, it gives you the serial number of the cabinet and things like that, uh, which is very helpful. It just presents a snapshot. So you'll notice on the dashboard, it's showing that the lights are off for instance, and the receptacles are off. Uh, if we turn the receptacles on, and uh, Mirko, could you uh, energize the receptacles on the cabinet? Yes, yeah, sure. It's on. Uh, that's not immediately seen on the dashboard, but if we refresh the dashboard, you'll see that it, uh, that the status of the receptacles will be updated from off to on. So you you get a sense in working with the with the with the dashboard and the apps you need to be sensitive to what causes the the data to be updated so let's go back to the dashboard and now we're going to see um, how the cabinet handles an alarm uh, so right now we're seeing on both the app and the dashboard that the uh, airflow is okay and the SAS position is working uh, and the fan is on. So Mirko, if you could put uh, papers across the front, this is just yes. a way for us to simulate uh, uh, an airflow problem um, and uh, for, for demonstration purposes. And what we're gonna be looking for is uh, uh, how that is reflected uh, with the app and with the dashboard. And yeah, Mirko, let us know when you see the airflow on your end, and then we can kind of see that, again, there's a typically a lag, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, something like that, for it uh, to appear in the summary and the notifications on the dashboard. And then also, um, uh, it'll show up in the event log once we clear it. So, I have the alarm now. Okay, and uh, uh, th this alarm, uh, we have it at the cabinet. We'll be seeing it on the app and the website shortly, if not already. Good. And then uh, now that now that we we now that we see the alarm, give one more second for that and then we'll uh, go ahead and remove the papers and, and, and see the recovery. Okay, now we have 
have the alarm here. Okay, so we have the alarm again. Okay, now go ahead and uh, remove the papers. And what we'll see, uh, it, it will take a, the, the cabinet needs a few moments to recover um, with the re removed restrictions, the fan will kind of overshoot and then come back to standard airflow. Let us know when we have good airflow at the cabinet. Now we are good again. Good, so the cabinet is showing good uh, and we'll see that reflected in the, um, in the dashboard and the uh, app. Okay, uh, thanks Mirko, appreciate it. Um, and um, uh, greetings to you from wonderful uh, the US. <laughs> we'll talk to you later. Bye -bye. Okay, no problem, you're welcome. The lack of smoothness on that, although um, uh, where uh, my friends will know that lack of smoothness has never been something that has been limited uh, for me. Uh, moving on uh, to the next slide. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, sorry, go, go back to where we were, uh, Maggie. Perfect. Um, we see four levels or types of connectivity. We've got monitoring where we're able to look at the connected cabinet and see its status. We could even look for past airflow alarms uh, with this application. Uh, with connected pipette aids, we actually have control. We're not directly, while we're not directly controlling the pipette aids, we're able to shape its use with standard protocols uh, and uh, via downloaded, uh, downloaded connections. Uh, optimization builds on control by using data for monitoring and the interaction of control to optimize uh, the, the device and its interaction with multiple devices. For cabinets, we saw a little of this, uh, or we could see a little of this because there's uh, they have alerts for upcoming service needed. Uh, this would allow a facility manager to coordinate third-party service provider visits. Uh, more exciting for us might be the BSC sensing someone entering the lab and starting up its fans uh, to be ready and operational for when they're ready to use it. Not something we can do now, uh, but something, but optimization could allow the equipment in the lab to work together uh, more efficiently. Uh, finally, there's autonomy. Uh, there are hints of this in some of the automated uh, systems that do automated ordering to maintain supply, maintain supplies of and consumables. In the future, this could be even more exciting. We could have labs that, that track usage of different equipments within the lab and proposes ways to avoid bottlenecks, uh, labs that know what other maintenance is occurring in the building and tries to coordinate things. But as we start talking about our laboratory equipment knowing things, data security becomes more significant. Uh, next slide. This is an area of transitional thinking. In the old days, your data was safest on uh, your personal computer with an air gap. However, over time, that air gap becomes increasingly inconvenient. We wanna get emails, we need to share files, we need to do research on electronic databases. We try to keep the separation, but gradually it evolves to just trying to limit our exposure, perhaps avoiding some websites and apps with known tracking capabilities. During this time, malicious intr intrusions are escalating. We hear about and maybe even experience ransomware attacks. We need to constantly update virus and malware protection on our computers. Protecting our computers becomes a full-time job and we already have full-time jobs. Next slide, please. Nowadays, it turns out that your data is more secure in protected cloud storage than on our non-encrypted laptop at home. Thermo Fisher Connect is hosted by an Amazon Web Services data center that has achieved the highest uh, levels of SSAE 16 certification and has a published service organization one report. Uh, the data is encrypted in transit and in storage. No personal information or information on research is stored. But data security is a moving target. Whatever it takes to be secure today, it will take more tomorrow by partnering with AWS and building a significant internal resource, 
we're able to provide an expertise and equipment to protect these services going forward. We're just starting on this journey. We're a little past that moment 50 years ago when cell phones started to gain popularity. At that point, we just thought they were mobile telephones, but now they remember our steps and, and uh, where we parked the car, uh, and they help us find friends. Back then, we had no idea how far that device would go. I think similarly, the connected lab is a future place uh, yet to be understood. Next slide, please. For cabinets, there are three general aspects or types of connectivity uh, when we think about safety cabinets. Workflow support, integration with building management systems, and process monitoring. Next slide, please. For those of us with Alexa, Siri, or Google Home, we're already familiar with the idea behind workflow support. In 2007, in 2007, the Federal Demonstration Partnership estimated that 42% of American researchers' time is spent on administrative tasks versus 18% 20 years before. Regulatory compliance, a part of that administrative responsibility, is consuming more and more resources. But what if we could reduce that trend? What if we could harness the advances in digital support and move a lot of these scientist-performed administrative tasks uh, to a sort of digital lab assistant. And this could reduce the current burden on laboratory scientists by up to 25%. Next slide, please. There's already movement in this direction with automated ordering and supply management software. There are a number of compliance support programs available. This is analogous to the introduction of digital technology to the office, where it helped people type documents through word processing, do calculations through spreadsheets, and manage lists and files with database management systems. You've seen our Instrument Connect program for the biosafety cabinet. Those and other services or other products will continue to expand uh, to other products, applications, and greater capabilities. For me, a key next step in the lab will be more user interfaces within the lab. When we're sitting at a biosafety cabinet and can speak to the system, when we can say, hey, Igor, uh, make sure I have enough buffer for tomorrow, and the digital interface says, yes, master. Next slide, please. Uh, and Igor starts to get smarter or more observant. Igor sees you enter the building and starts up the cabinet you're scheduled to use. Igor watches your hand movements processing the samples, and based on the degree of hazard in the work, signals you to slow down. Igor knows the protocols and monitors as the laboratorians work through the processes. Igor anticipates equipment needs and head off, heads off bottlenecks. As we become more familiar with Igor, and Igor becomes more familiar with us, uh, and gets to know Siri and Alexa in the cloud, more advanced systems become more engaged in the science of what we can do, recording results, analyzing results, down the road, monitoring publications for relevant new findings. But for now, let's go to one of the, uh, to a different application one that's probably maybe the first application, building management systems. Next slide, please. In 1883, Warren Johnson invented the thermostat, really just a light that would go on in the boiler room that would tell the attendants when to shovel more coal into the furnace, and officially kicked off the idea of automatically controlling building systems. Next slide. Over time, more building systems acquired automation, for instance, lighting and security. We realized it would be helpful to integrate these systems to gain greater efficiencies, for instance, dimming the lights in public areas and reducing the amount of heating or cooling to non-occupancy. One of the key drivers towards this integration was energy conservation, and that remains a focus of many BMS systems. However, it's not simple to effectively capture BSC energy use within a building. Uh, let me explain. Next slide, please. BSC and energy use have three dimensions. First, we have the, what state the BSC is, on, is in. In 2008, the University of Michigan compared one of their new energy efficient biosafety cabinets to three of the typical cabinets at the time. The energy consumption, you can see the energy consumption varies with the cabinet. See in the first row, cabinet A consumes 841 watts, while the DC motor unit uses less than a fourth as much. The second dimension is use. Different states, on, off, or reduced flow, lights on or off, 
UV germicidal lights on or off, all of these consume di energy differently. Notice that for the same cabinet on our chart, the use can go from over 800 watts in use with the lights on to zero when not in use. One dimension is the cabinet. The second dimension would be the state of the cabinet. What's the third? It's time. The, the status, the, the states change over time. We know cabinets vary due to model width, type, and more. We know individual cabinets vary depending on how we are using them. The third dimension is how much time is spent in each state. An energy hog of a cabinet that's only used for an hour a day will consume less energy than an energy efficient cabinet that's in constant use, particularly if that constant use may be not, it may not be necessary. We cannot ask what is the energy consumption without asking how much it is used and how it is set up when it's not in use. Next slide. In 2011, we, we surveyed approximately 90 BSCs at a North American university. This is a graph with how many hours per week the cabinets were used on the horizontal axis against how many hours per week the biosafety cabinets were operating on the vertical axis. We can see there are basically two types of users falling on two lines. Uh, next slide, please. Of the people across the top, we'll call them super operators that leave the cabinet on all the time, whether or not they're using it. And this is not an uncommon or unknown trend when it comes to biosafety cabinets. Some people feel they should leave them on all the time, even when they're not using it. Also, notice there are, sig and, and notice there are significant numbers of people in this group. We also have the people along the slanted line that we'll call a la carte users. In general, they have the cabinet on when they're using it and turn it off when they're not using it. When we track energy usage, whether we realize it or not, we're looking at these two different types of users. It will take more than a BMS system to manage that energy use. We're gonna to need to find out what usage policy and practices are in place and engage there. Next slide, please. This is a summary, uh, building on the idea, this is a summary of the annual cost of operation over, of, over the, of the over 800 units we have surveyed at various locations. We measured the energy consumption in different states for each of the cabinets. We interviewed the users to find out how much they used them in each of the different states. And then we multiplied those hours by the different rates of energy consumption and combined it with the cost of exhaust when applicable. Other than noticing the significance of external exhaust, the red and yellow are exhausted cabinets, notice the variation from a low of less than $50 per year to almost $8,000 per year. For our building management system dashboard, we could track energy use and such, but for some cabinets, it would be insignificant relative to the cost of the building. But if we had enough of the costly cabinets, it might make sense. But remember, costly is a function of both the cabinet itself and the use of the cabinet. The reason we went into this detail is to point out that effectively using BSC energy information provided to a building management management system will re require engagement with usage, safety, and environmental policies and procedures. It could be challenging for some cabinets, but not an, or not really worth the time. Let's take a look at an example. Next slide, please. Using the survey data, we'll make a boatload of assumptions and kind of an imaginary building with 100 biosafety cabinets. Again, just to get a sense of how it might look. Uh, so we have 100 biosafety cabinets. 11 of them are class two type B2 cabinets, which have high exhaust. 19 are canopy A2s, which have some exhaust. And the remaining 70 cabinets are vented to the laboratory. Uh, we're gonna assume that 70% of the BSC users are those a la carte users and 30% are the super operators. We're also going to assume that the average weekly use of the cabinet is 17.6 hours. We got that from the survey, uh, which we presented at the CDC Sustainability Symposium in 2012. And then we're gonna assume an average cost of electricity of 11.29 cents per kilowatt hour and a cost of exhaust of $4.50 per CFM per year. If we come up with the total cost of the annual cost of that population of 100 biosafety cabinets, it turns out if we had a way to at 10 o'clock every night uh, that any cabinet left in operation would be automatically shut down, C 
theoretically, we could save almost half of the total cost of energy for those 100 cabinets for over $20,000. Uh, there are a lot of things buried in that if. Should we turn a cabinet off remotely? Uh, well, maybe if we give it lots of warning, if it doesn't turn completely off, but rather closes the window and goes into a standby is in containment. There are many people that hate this idea, but I have to tell you, I get the question every couple of years. Another issue is security. There are some users, including government and pharma users, who are very sensitive to the flow of information outside the physical plant. You can see the security concerns on one side, but we also see the benefits of continued manufacturer engagement with some equipment. Users of Apple iPhones and iPad get regular messages saying, hey, we're gonna update the software on your device tonight. And it's mostly a good thing. They correct vulnerabilities in the system and add new features. I don't know how all these issues will get resolved, but I do think the advantages to connectedness overall, that there'll be some sort of accommodation or a way forward uh, to be identified. Uh, next slide. Back to building management systems. It's not uncommon for building management systems to try to go beyond energy conservation. They would like to identify or even predict equipment failure. Uh, here I'd like to uh, introduce a term, attended operation. On the left is a photo of a freezer farm and on the right is a biosafety cabinet. Uh, one obvious difference is, the cabinet, uh, is that the cabinet has a person sitting at it. Almost all the biosafety cabinet's purpose is fulfilled with a person working, with a person working in the cabinet. Unlike freezers, the biosafety cabinet has attended operation. Uh, un freezers, incubators, and some other types of equipment provide much of their value working while unattended. For these devices, an unattended, an automated system to monitor this unattended operation is tremendously helpful. There are systems allowing these devices to call you at home, warning of failure or other critical condition. This can allow your organization to preserve important samples. In contrast, most of the biosafety cabinet alarms and alerts are intended for the person working at the biosafety cabinet. We have window position alarms to tell you, uh, to remind you to put the window back in operating position before you start using it. Uh, we have airflow alarms signaling when there's disruptions in the airflow, like we saw with our video with Mirko. But you may not need to be called at home to let you know that your friend at work is going through these alarms. In the future, we may begin using cabinets in a different way, in an unattended way, uh, as some sort of ventilated clean storage. I don't see that, but I remember back in the day, I didn't understand why we needed cameras on our phones and I was wrong there. But for now, it's important to note that almost all biosafety cabinet use is attended and there's greatly reduced need for remote monitoring as we already have a trained person at the device. They need to know what's going on, but it's less so for somebody at the facility's control room. But if we did monitor it, what could we monitor? Next slide, please. Here's an example from our class two type B2 BSC. We have a USB port on the cabinet and you can select whether it outputs this string of data every second, every 10 seconds, 30 seconds, or a minute. The first 11 characters or so give the equipment status, you know, what's on, what's off, window position, alarm status, fan speed setting. The remaining characters give RPM, airflow sensor data, inflow and downflow velocities. Uh, very nice, but remember, again, this is an attended device. People are interacting with them. Is the sash not at working height because somebody bumped into it and is ignoring the alarm and is continuing to work, so we should do something? Or did they just, are they just raising the windows so that they can more easily load in supplies or clean the work area? Tracking some of this information over time can almost reduce its value. If we detect an alarm and can look and ask the user if everything's okay, that's great. But if we find out that we had a window position alarm that came on 10 o'clock in the morning yesterday, well, what can we really do with that? If we see the fan is uh, fan RPM is zero, but the fan is on, we could see that's a problem. But what, what other than that, what other types of data can we parse out of the RPM and, and, and other sensor data? Uh, just as a side point, BSC fans don't fail very frequently. Cabinets seem to run relatively well. There may not be 
uh, a large need to uh, predict failure if failures aren't that common. I'm not saying there's no value here. I'm saying we need to think about it a little. Uh, what should we track? What do we want to do with the information? Uh, and then how, we, how should we proceed? In contrast, our freezer group has this great technology that monitors and anticipates compressor failures. That's, like, that's an ideal example. You have these massive freezer farms with valuable samples running constantly with nobody watching them. It's a great fit for this technology. For BSC, the value may not be as, as high. Moving on, our third variant of connectivity is process monitoring. And to lay the groundwork for that, I wanna walk over to this cabinet here and demonstrate cleanliness and containment. So with the biosafety cabinet, the, uh, if you are using biosafety cabinet in the process monitoring, there, you probably want a couple things. First, the GMP customers want uh, a clean environment. Now this is, a, this is a class two type A2 cabinet. I have a particle counter set up here to beep. The air inside is 100,000 times cleaner than the air outside. But you can't see that, but with the aid of this helpful particle counter, I'll turn it on. And as it begins to pull the particles from the air, it's going to begin to beep. And that's just the normal stuff that's in the air. Now, if I place it in the cabinet, it disappears. So they're out here, this is probably an ISO class 8, ISO class 9 environment in there. It's an ISO class 5, quite possibly cleaner. Most process monitoring is required for GMP type customers, self therapy type customers. And these customers um, first want that the work area be clean, be ISO class 5 clean. And, that's, and they get that uh, with the HEPA filters inside the cabinet. The second feature that a cabinet provides that you don't get from a clean bench or um, uh, a clean bench or a, a horizontal flow bench, could you give me some smoke, uh, is containment. It's not just that the air, the air in here is cleaner than the air out here. The really cool thing about a biosafety cabinet is that the air in here cannot get out here. So. Let me turn off my beeper. Good. So the air in here is clean. And so you notice with the smoke, it cannot get into the cabinet. That's kind of what we expected. That's how it stays clean in there. And even though it's dirty out here. But the exciting thing is, is when we look at, can the air in there get out here? And notice, it's not, that anything inside the cabinet is staying inside the cabinet. The value of a class two biosafety cabinet in most uh, process monitoring for GMP and cell therapy type applications is that it's a clean and contained area. Also notice the smoke, it's kind of a lot, so you can see a lot, but notice even though I'm releasing smoke here, it's not quite getting everywhere. Uh, the nature of the biosafety cabinet with the uniform downflow is it tends to limit the ability of contamination to go from one part of the cabinet to the other. So let me go ahead and have this turned off. And then we'll go back and take a, uh, and continue on the presentation and look at the requirements under uh, uh, Annex 1 of the of GMP. Oops. Give me the next slide, please. So it turns out that pharmaceutical manufacturing and per perhaps other applications require process monitoring. And for example, here, and we see in pages three and four of the European Commission's Annex 1, with guidelines for the production of sterile medicinal products, we find we need to monitor the cleanliness of the air. Remember, that was one of the things that we needed the most. And that's usually done with particle monitoring like we did. Uh, 
for the full duration of critical processing. So when you're doing the, the sensitive step of preparing the drug or whatever, uh, you need to monitor the air cleanliness. Uh, the, the other thing is, is that if they, if we just needed a clean environment, we would probably just use a clean room or a horizontal flow bench. Because we want a biosafety cabinet, we want that containment. So if we're going to monitor the process, we also need to monitor that containment. We need to have some way to monitor that airflow, that balance of inflow and downflow at the front opening. And how can we do that? Next slide, please. It's not unusual for cabinets to have a dry or voltage-free contact. These were originally intended to signal an external exhaust fan when somebody turns on the exhaust, the BSC fan, an external, uh, an external fan on the roof would come on and would draw it. And you would use this if you had an externally exhausted class two type A2, or if you had a, uh, one of the hard ducted cabinets, a B1 or a B2. And the idea is when I turn on the fan in the BSC, it would automatically turn on this secondary exhaust fan that I needed. Using our cabinets as an example, we have a monitor connection that will open or close the circuit, whichever you want, when the fans are operational, full speed, and there are no alarms activated. As I mentioned, in our case, we've got a window position alarm and an airflow alarm. The airflow alarm will signal when the inflow is too high or too low, or when the downflow is too high or too low. We also have an external fan connection that will open or close when the fans are operational full speed. This allows a user to have an external fan to, to come on whenever they want to turn on the cabinet and open the window. But for GMP, given the validated containment velocities, we can use this function to send a signal when the BSC velocities go out of range or when they're in range. And this gives the GMP users the ability to monitor airflow for containment. Different cabinets have different capabilities, but dry contacts are not uncommon. We can see that to meet regulatory requirements for process monitoring, we would need to think through in some detail what these yes-no circuits mean and whether they're helpful enough. Additional sensors could be added. Uh, velocity sensors could be uh, applied for inflow and downflow. Pressure sensors could uh, check a flow across filters for overall flow. Um, We'd have to be careful in installing them to make sure we don't breach any uh, safety barriers. Uh, but in general, the data from the contacts, contacts, the sensors, and particle counters would need to be captured and formatted in a helpful way. We could also have a problem in synchronizing that data with our attended use cabinet. Opening the window beyond operational height is okay for preparation, but not when we're doing the critical processing. So we would need some way to know when it's being used for critical processing and when it's being used for just setup or, or not in use at all. Again, defining a connected cabinet for process monitoring isn't necessarily direct and simple. Uh, next slide, please. So what, so what can we do with our cabinet today? Uh, here are some suggestions on the topic of biosafety cabinet connectivity. Uh, First, when the topic comes up, I strongly figure out, uh, I strongly suggest that we figure out which type that we're talking about. Uh, often the tone of these meetings seems to be, you know, let's do connectivity. I think we need the context of why we are pursuing it. Are we pursuing it for process monitoring or for BMS or, or for something else? Uh, second, for BMS applications, for energy use, energy conservation type applications, can find, Think about how you're going to capture the use data. I'm, I know I'm often asked for data connectivity of little value. Yes, we can put in a uh, pressure sensor. Yes, we can put in uh, you know, something else, uh, but is that really going to help you figure out how the cabinet's being used as far as energy consumption and how it can be used more effectively? Uh, for process monitoring, I'm actually a, a big fan of process monitoring. The, the GMP requirements is that you monitor all the critical processes. We talked before or showed in the demonstration that the BSC end of this is probably the air cleanliness, which would be some sort of particle monitoring. And then the, uh, uh, the balance of inflow and downflow or the containment at the front. There will be other things you need to monitor for your process, depending on the process, you know, temperature, flow rates, you know, things like that. 
but the BSC end of it will require that cleanliness component and that uh, containment component, and we'll need to think about how we want to capture that. And then we also have the attended versus non-attended issue that we need to address. Finally, for the exciting future of workflow support, uh, I think we, we look forward to the opportunities. It's coming. I, I don't think we have a good sense of what it's going to look like on the other side. More and more devices will be connected. More and more devices uh, uh, will provide different kinds of data, give us the ability to make different decisions. And uh, I, I think we just have to have to keep our eyes open and try to harness, uh, try to win the future uh, for safety and, and uh, containment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what can we do now? Well, first, if you're interested in doing connection now, think about why, uh, because that, that makes a big difference. Um, for, uh, for workflow support, I would encourage you to, to add capability and, and, uh, and see what you can do with it, kind of uh, almost play with the technology and, and learn how to use it more effectively. Uh, for BMS, uh, there has to be a strong linkage into the, the policies and procedures of your facility because that's where a lot of the energy conservation is going to be. Uh, and for, for process monitoring, there's a real opportunity in the remote contacts and, and almost all biosafety cabinets have some sort of remote or dry voltage contact. So it's quite possible that there is capability there as long as we understand it correctly and can apply it well. Uh, so that's the presentation and I look forward to any questions uh, you might have. Thank you, David, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, how can I connect an old BSC for process monitoring? Uh, thank you. Yeah, like I said, the, the exciting thing is there is probably uh, some sort of rudimentary characteristic already there for the uh, the airflow piece with the dry contacts. So I would I would dig out the operator's manual. Uh, you may have to to uh, play with it a little bit to find out uh, what it shows. Does it just show the fan coming on and off? Uh, or does it also include some alarm capability, either in that one contact or alternative contacts? Um, if there is, uh, if you don't have anything like that, most of the older cabinets have an ability to, uh, it, it's usually claimed as the ability to monitor the airflow. Really, it's usually putting some sort of a velocity sensor on the exhaust, uh, but that would move you closer to that. And then for the air cleanliness part, as I mentioned, you would just tie, you would need uh, some sort of a particle counter probe placed inside the cabinet. Many cabinets today have uh, have passages provided for contained, uh, for a way to, to push a tube in a contained way to sample from within the, the, the biosafety cabinet work area. So that would give you the cleanliness part and the containment part would come through. Uh, some sort of uh, uh, remote contact or perhaps having to buy an, an accessory to, to measure exhaust airflow would be the easiest way with what you have now. Great, thank you. Next question, is the data connection to your new cabinet 21 CFR compliant? Oh, that's, that's a good one. Uh, not yet, and I think I think a lot of that's because uh, at this point we don't really store data on the cabinet. Uh, the data that comes out of the cabinet, again, my my evolving understanding of the requirements of the uh, of the of 21 CFR is that uh, the, the data needs to be stored in a protected, uh, controlled way, and since the cabinet doesn't do that storage, uh, at this point the cabinet could reliably pass data to, to your 21 CFR compliant system, and then from there pick it up. I'm sure it'll be a capability that our systems will be adding later because there's a high degree of interest in that. Great, thank you. Next question. 
We saw what the current workflow support for BSCs offers and understand it will continue to expand. What do you think we will see next? Oh, that that's, you know, that's, I, I, I uh, mentioned at the beginning, I was a BSC person. And that's actually something I like to think about at night before I go to sleep, you know, uh, uh, because, you know, our, our phones do so amazing, so many amazing things, you know, uh, uh, I, I and 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 games and things like that uh do so many amazing things i the 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 i think the first round will be very basic the second round will tend to uh fill in the holes uh you know provide uh you know more of the data stream you saw from the b2 and 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 things like that to make it easier for people who want to capture that kind of data the third round i think will get kind of intriguing and for there, I'm looking for uh, some ability for the user to communicate to or through the cabinet. Uh, you know, a couple times I mentioned one of the pro problems with process monitoring is you can't tell when somebody's working or when they're just setting up. So there's going to need to be some sort of way to provide that data, capture that data, whether it's a button you tap before you start working, whether we find some way the cabinet can tell when you've started working, you know, like like nowadays with phones, it can tell when you're looking at it, the screen will light up because it senses that you've moved it in a certain way. Um, so, you know, one is just to get started and, and, and we're definitely in that mode. Two, we'll be kind of filling in the holes, uh, but three will be interesting because I think that's where we'll, we'll move into some interesting territory. Great, next question. I am a volunteer CAP inspector, and I gave deficiencies for obstruction of the grids. Please, what is the clearance standard for all the safety cabinets? Thank you. Um, there, the, okay, so, so okay, the, I, there's a couple questions. The first question, if you're asking for uh, how much the front and rear intake grills must be uh, clear, uh, there's no place, I don't think there's a place that actually says uh, you can't put anything on the grills. I think there are a number of places, and if you send me your email, I'll, I'll be happy to send them to you, uh, that advise that to say, you know, don't put things on the grill, it blocks the air and things like that, which would give you the basis for that kind of recommendation. Now, if you're asking for clearance around the cabinet, uh, the best kind of authoritative resource for that in, in North America is NSF ANSI 49. Currently, I think the 220 version is out. Um, and I think it asks for six to 12 inches on each side. Uh, on top, um, I, I, I'd have to look it up. It's, it's uh, 12 to 24 inches. Uh, in reality, that can be checked by the certifier, but for you and your role, uh, uh, for as you know, seeking kind of overall generic compliance, uh, you need the standard. So, so I would recommend finding the clearances in uh, the NSF document. And like I said, I'd be happy to to send those to you. I don't know if I remember the exact distances off the top of my head. Great, thank you. And looks like we have time for one more question. What are the systems available for monitoring in the market? Uh, any self-cleaning systems? Oh, um, I'm trying to. Uh, so I'm 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 guessing the question is how to monitor the the self-cleaning systems inside a cabinet. I'm not sure uh, the the standard the standard way to use a biosafety cabinet is you need to surface decontaminate it on the inside before you start work and then once you finish you have to you have to do that again um, there are some uh, you in, in some pharma applications and and in some uh, i think i think europe you run into a little bit uh they'll i've heard of occasionally like fumigation cycles where they'll use hydrogen peroxide vapor to uh, to try to clean the inside of the work area. I was never able to really get a sense of how common that was. Um, 
I don't know, typically on those, they validate a particular cycle and then just repeat the cycle versus validating it each time. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I have a good enough understanding of the question to be able to answer that correctly. But again, uh, if you'd like to uh, provide your email, I'd be happy to engage with you on that. Sounds like an interesting topic. Great. Well, thank you, David. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Uh, no, thank you very much. I think biosafety cabinets are a blast. I love talking to people about it. So uh, uh, definitely, uh, I look forward to seeing you sometime in the future, hopefully in person. Stay safe. Great, you too. Well, thank you again, David, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.